Hello. First and foremost, I'd like to extend a warm hello and thank you all for joining us in welcoming Victoria Carter and Alfred Baptiste to Hamilton's campus. My name is Kimon Jordan, and I am a junior here at Hamilton, currently pursuing a degree in environmental studies with a concentration in urban development. It is my joy to share this evening with you. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the Days Masolo Center works very hard to put on events that enlighten and uplift the Hamilton community. We are honored today to have members of the Lacks family present to present on and discuss Henrietta Lacks' legacy. The Lacks, family will the Lacks family members will tell their own story, followed by a moderated discussion with Hamilton's very own professor of literature, Vincent O'Dampton. After that, we may have time for some audience questions, depending on how long the dialogue lasts. To conclude the event, there will be an opportunity for a book signing after the discussion. Our speakers for this evening are Victoria Baptiste and Alfred Carter, Jr. Victoria Baptiste is Henrietta Lacks' great-granddaughter and travels regularly to talk about the Lacks family story. Inspired by Henrietta's life, she is a nurse at the University of Maryland's Medical Center. Alfred Carter, Jr. is the son of Deborah Lacks. An ex-Marine, he's currently the president and CEO of the Henrietta Lacks House of Healing, which offers transitional housing for disabled men and women suffering from substance abuse. I'd like to extend a major thank you for you being willing to share your family's story. In doing so, her narrative is given life and her legacy is strengthened. Please join me in a round of applause to welcome Victoria Baptiste and Alfred Carter, Jr. Thank you everyone for having us and on behalf of my family, we enjoy each time that we are invited out to go to an event to be able to spread the word and the legacy of Henrietta. Thank you for being here. Um, as a young lady stated, I'm Alfred Carter Jr. Um, Henrietta's grandson, Deborah Lax, was my mother. And I'm just pleased that everyone came out to celebrate this day and so my cousin and I can enlighten everyone on what we know about Henrietta and the lives that we lead. So what you see before you now is the cover of the book that came out in 2009 um, by the author Rebecca Skloot. So we like to say when that book came out, it also started a new chapter in our lives as a family. Here you'll see one of the only existing pictures we have of Henrietta and David Lacks. Up at the top there, you'll see a picture of what you think is a dilapidated house, which will be correct. But it is also what we call the family house that is in Clover, Virginia, where Henrietta and David grew up. And as children, when we used to go to Clover, Virginia, we used to see this house right here and we used to hear all kinds of spooky stories, and I used to hate walking by that house at night. <laughs> and then you'll see a street sign that says Laxtown, because that is what, it, what it's called in Clover, Virginia. It's such a small little knit place, but when you go there, you'll see a bunch of Laxes there and extended family. Right here, the top left, you have my beautiful mother, Deborah Lax uh, and Rebecca Skloot. Um, I'm not sure what event they were at that day. Do you know what event they were at? I was never told. And the bottom right is my mother and my uncle, Zakaria Abdul Rahman. Um, this was the first time that they seen the HeLa cells under the microscope. And Actually, it's the first time I've seen this Windex bottle in the picture, too. Really? <laughs> it's always been there, I guarantee you that. Wow. So this beautiful, color, colorful picture you see here is a picture of the HeLa cells under the microscope. We know that HeLa cells are awesome, and they are special, but they are not this color normally. <laughs> so these are beautifully stained and all that good stuff for us to be able to see it well. At the bottom, you see some of our family members at what we um, call 
microscope day that they give sometimes at Hopkins where family members and friends or people of the community can come and see the HeLa cells beneath the microscope. And also, the, the man in the white jacket, he works for Johns Hopkins. His name is Dr. Jim Potter. Um, he's very instrumental in keeping Henrietta's legacy alive. He comes to uh, a lot of events that I give and speak upon uh, precision medication. So what you see here at the bottom, I like to start there because that was a very um, important day. So the house that, da that David and Henrietta came to when they came to Maryland is in um, Turner Station in Maryland. And the house is still there. But the people that are occupying it along with the community members agreed to let this marker be put on there to make it a historical landmark in Turner Station. And in the picture you'll see Dr. Roland Patillo of the Morehouse School of Medicine, my grandfather Lawrence Lex, and my uncle Sonny Lex there um, on the porch. At the top is a museum um, exhibit showing you know, the Healers, Healers contribution to science. And then we have here Hela High. It was a high school that was named for Henrietta in Vancouver, Washington. I have not had the pleasure to go yet, but that is on my bucket list of things to do. This jubilant bunch of people is myself and various family members um, on what is called World Book Night. So every year, whether you guys know it or not, there's something called World Book Night, where different authors are chosen in their books, of course, um, to give out different books for free in different communities. So this particular year, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lex was chosen, and Rebecca Sloot contacted us and was like, would you guys be interested in helping pass out some books in your community? And we're like, yes. So we all went out and passed out those books, and that was the same day that that movie, uh, Think Like a Man, came out. And in that movie, there's, you can see a co the cover of the book, and they mention the book in there. So we, after we finished passing all the books, we went to the movies with Rebecca and embarrassed her profusely, you know, in the movie theater. So we like to share that. Okay, right here at the top left is a picture of myself, my mother, um, maybe six months before she passed away in 2009, and my son, Alfred Carter III. Um, this is when, uh, as a sh uh, with a show of hands, how many people read the book? Good. So, you all know my character. Um, I was the bad one. Was the bad one. Um, this picture right here, I was in prison. Um, I was doing a 15 year, well, actually I was doing a 30 year prison sentence. Um, I got my life together, uh, changed my ways. Um, I did 15 years, I made parole, and today I'm a CEO and a president. Uh, and So my mission today is to help people that was in the, that's in the position that I once was. Um, I was fortunate enough to have family members that loved me and supported me. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that that's in prison. So I offer a platform for guys that's in prison that don't have family. And I have a transitional housing program where I house eight people and I get those guys jobs, all kinds of wraparound services. Um, and it's just gratifying for me to be able to give back and to honor my grandmother and keep her legacy alive. Um, the bottom right is my mom and my nephew and my sister. My sister's name is Latanya Carter and my nephew name is Davon. And this, this picture was at my cousin Jerry's uh, wedding and um, as you know, I wasn't, I wasn't in attendance, um, but uh, it, was, it was a, I got a lot of pictures. <laughs> so, yeah. This picture here is with Dr. Roland Patillo once again from the Morehouse School of Medicine, my uncle Sonny, 
And the young lady you see in the background is Mama, that's what we call her, Bobette Lack, which you, if you've read the book, you know who she is as well. Um, so Dr. Roland Patillo and the Morehouse School of Medicine, as well as Dr. Roland Patillo's wife, donated um, the tombstone, the head marker for Henrietta's grave site that went um, without one for many, many years. So we were so happy and just blessed. That was a blessing for, for them to do that because he didn't have to. He had been, he's one of the people who was instrumental in putting out, you know, the message of Henrietta and her legacy even before the book came out and before the movie came out. He was already, you know, doing things to commemorate her. Yes, Dr. Patillo is a, he's a great man. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, he's one of my board members on, um, you know, for my organization. Um, and as you can see, the, the headstone is shaped in uh, like, a book. like a book. So I thought that was very nice. Which most people don't even realize, including <laughs> family members. <laughs> and at the same time, they also donated a head um, tombstone for Elsie, which again, you've heard about in the book. So that was like a double blessing. Like he could have just, you know, did the one, but he was like, nope, we're gonna do both. So. We were very humbled by that and very appreciative. And for those who don't know, Elsie, my Aunt Elsie was, um, she died from epilepsy um, at age 15 in a, a mental institution. Crownsville. Uh, Crownsville in, in Maryland. Um, and it's just a shame, you know, for a young lady to have to suffer and go through the things that she yeah, went through. If you yeah, you read the book, you know all the things that she went through. And, um, you know, I just thank God and hope, you know, glad she's resting in peace now. So this is a highway marker um, that's close by Clover, Virginia. And what my Uncle Sonny used to like to say, he's still alive, I'm not saying used to like he's not here, but used to when he used to do these events. I would like to tell people that, you know, Clover is so small that if you pass by that head market, you've probably already passed through Clover already because it's so small. But that was another honor, you know, to have a highway marker to commemorate Henrietta. So whether you realize it or not, every time somebody drives past and they see that name, you're internalizing a bit of that legacy. Self-explanatory, Morehouse School of Medicine. So that great guy we were just talking about, Dr. Roland Patillo, this is where he practices, where he teaches, and he is also um, a doctor of women's studies there. And this is at one of the events that he's given over the years annually. He usually does um, a Henrietta Lacks Symposium. And at this time, um, they had a bust, that's what that thing is called, a bust, of Henrietta May. You can't really see it, the picture doesn't really do it justice, but they, uh, we were commemorated with a bust for Henrietta, which is down there, it's still at the Morehouse yeah, School of there. Medicine. And Dr. Roland Patillo still does these annually, every year. Symposium. The next one is um, the 29th of this month. At this month. Yes. And this is my cousins, Erica and Courtney. They are with a young man who is at one of the local high schools in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, this particular event at the Morehouse School of Medicine, the young man in his high school did a play commemorating Henrietta, but it was supposed to depict different family members. And he so happened to have played my grandfather. And my cousins were like, he did such a great job, you know, depicting my grandfather that they had to have a picture of him to commemorate you know, and always mm -hmm. have them in their memory. So that's how that little cute guy got in there. <laughs> okay, this right here is the Turner Station Heritage and Praise Day Celebration. This is in historic Turner Station. For all those who don't know, Turner Station is a peninsula in eastern Baltimore County where a lot of African Americans migrated from down south. Mostly the guys were working at Bethlehem Steel shipyard and every year um, Miss Courtney Speed and the Henrietta Lacks Legacy Group have this celebration every year. And which she was also um, very much involved in um, 
Henrietta Lacks and her legacy even before the book came out, meaning that she was one who was a historian of sorts for Turner Station. And anybody that lived in Turner Station and did anything great, she like keeps a record of that. So she was really um, commemorating, finding, trying to find ways to commemorate Henrietta even before the book came out. And her catchphrase is, save the nation of Turner Station. She loved to say that. <laughs> It's catchy. <laughs> this is a picture of a bunch of us family members at one of the annual Johns Hopkins um, Henrietta Lacks lectures. So each year, Johns Hopkins um, puts on a lecture with different authors um, that talk about different um, things that happen in medicine or different apartheid that happen in the African American community. So they choose an author each year and they also choose some scientists that are doing different things with the HeLa cells. And they get to tell, you know, they tell everybody about what their science is, what their practice is, and what they've been able to find and discover using the HeLa cells. So that happens annually. And no, that was not happening before the book came out. This is um, a charity called Kids Play for Good, and this was hosted at Loyola College in Maryland. Kids Play for Good is just that. It's children, little young ones out here that choose a different um, cause each year or a couple of times a year, and they play, put on tennis matches to raise money to donate to those causes. This particular year, they chose the Lax family, and we were able to go and see these amazing little people putting on these tennis matches. And it just goes to show you are never too young to make a difference. And I always like to say Uncle Sonny was in a great mood because the dog that he is holding was the mascot for the um, foundation, and he is not an animal lover, but he was in a good mood. He was being a team player, <laughs> and we were all just praying. <laughs> that he didn't have any accidents. <laughs> so here, um, this is in Virginia, where they presented us, uh, well, presented Henrietta with um, a decree. And what they usually say is that there's always somebody that's a naysayer in these events. You know, they have to vote on it. And this particular one, it was historic in the fact that one, they were giving this to Henrietta, but two, that no one, it was unanimous. No one had any nays, everybody said, you know, yes. So that was, you know, another important moment for us. And this is Uncle Sonny getting a um, degree from Morgan State University on behalf of Henrietta and he was just ecstatic. One, to be getting the degree, and two, to be walking across that stage with all those young people. He loved the energy when he comes to the colleges of all the young minds that are out here that's gonna make a difference in the future. So he was ecstatic to accept that on behalf of his mother and also to be you know, walking across that stage. Okay, right here you have three paintings. Uh, these paintings were done by a young lady um, named Helen Wilson Rowe. She lives in Bristol, England. Um, the left one is my Uncle Sonny. The, the one in the center is my Uncle Abdul. And the one on the right is my Uncle Lawrence. All these are Henrietta's children. Um, these paintings are now hanging in two museums over in England. I think one is in London and one is in uh, Bristol. So what the purpose of the paintings was the artist, she thought that this could be another way to tell Henrietta's story and to, press, to pass on her legacy by doing it with an oil painting. So for all you arts majors, I know it's a liberal arts school, all you arts majors, you make a difference even just by painting us a picture. You can tell so much. You can, we have had so much history, you know, kept by different, different paintings and things of that nature. So keep doing what you do. This um, actually is a young lady who works in a furniture store. So my cousin Jerry, her husband's name is Tom, and- Tom and Jerry, the I know, I was not gonna even do it. <laughs> I was gonna let that slide by. But he is a, Tom is a truck driver, and he goes to different locations. Well, he happens to be delivering some things to this location, and the young lady, somehow or another, they got on the discussion of the book. And she was saying that she wished that 
it was, you know, in Korean, so she could, you know, pass it on to her family members so they could read the story as well. So she probably thought she would never hear anything back by that, you know, or see Tom again. But he came home, talked to my cousin Jerry, and she got in contact with Rebecca to see if the book had been, you know, put in, made in Korean, and it had. And they got her a copy of the book and took it back to her. So it just shows that, you know, this story has a worldwide, you know, effect. And this is um, my sister Veronica in the center, my cousin Jerry to your left, and my cousin David, my cousin, I mean my Aunt Shirley, and they are with Francis Collins, who is in charge of the NIH. So I, a few years ago, the Henrietta Lacks genome sequence was put out there, and it was like, oh goodness, something else that was that's happening that we didn't even know about. So, um, you know, Francis Collins, along with Rebecca Sclute and everything, you know, made some strides in making a family feel like they had some say so this time, meaning they had some meetings and they talked to different various family members, of course not all of us, but you know, a good number of them, to see what they can do to try to make us feel more included in the situation so we wouldn't feel like this was just another thing that was happening in science behind our backs with the um, HeLa cells. So they came to the conclusion that they would put two family members on the board, not saying that we have any power to veto anything, saying that you know they could at least be in the loop, the family could be in the loop of what they're using the genome for. And um, they came to the fact that the genome scientists would now have to fill out an application to get access to it. And as long as they felt like this was something for the greater good of people, that they would let them have access to it. And from what I'm told, they've never had to tell anyone no yet. They haven't had to decline anybody from having access to it yet that has applied for it. Okay, and this um, is a proclamation that was given to Henrietta with Stephanie Rollins Blake and my cousin Kim and my Aunt Shirley. And Stephanie Rollins Blake Let's is the back. former mayor oh, of Baltimore yeah, City. Former, that's why I didn't even mention it. So this is some family members, my grandfather, my cousin Jerry, her husband Tom, you see smiling bright, that's Tom over there. Um, my mom and my cousin David, um, and Miss Courtney Speed, the young lady with the hat. Um, they're at the governor's mansion, and they were inducting um, Henrietta into the Maryland's Women Hall of Fame that day. And of course, you know, the family like, oh, we got to go to the governor's mansion. Next thing you know, we're gonna be trying to go to the White House. And we did, look at us. <laughs> so we were invited to come to the White House when- I wasn't invited. You, you want you home? I still wouldn't have been See, invited. You don't know. <laughs> Well, my president, I'm sorry, number 44, um, they invited us into when he was first launching the Precision Medicine Initiative. So that was like, first of all, I want y'all to all know I'm special. He might have got to see Oprah and everything. You know, okay. But President, the President Barack Obama touched my hand. <laughs> he held, like, not just like, oh, no, it was like he held it. We made eye contact. <laughs> And we had a good 30 second conversation, just me and him, like nobody else existed. I just want to oh, let y'all know. Oh, Michelle was there. She had eyes on you. Okay, and so was the puppies <laughs> and the security team, but what we have is real, okay? 30 seconds, <laughs> okay? We always go back and forth about this. Yes. Because I, I got a chance to take Oprah to dinner. Anybody can take Oprah to no, dinner. No, anybody can. But cannot. who got to sit there and have President Barack Obama, hold that hand. No, okay. Oh, oh, wait, oh, wait, uh, Oprah. I contact, 30 seconds. Oprah reached over with her fork and took a piece of okay, fish so off what? my plate. Anybody can get some of that DNA, you know what I mean? Barack. <laughs> That's almost like a unicorn, I'm trying to tell you. So this was another honor that Henrietta received from Susan G. Coleman, which we know do, they do a lot for women with breast cancer and advocating for women's health. 
this is us the same day, and we that the um, we had another proclamation for Henrietta at the event where we were um, being celebrated by the Susan G. Coleman. This is uh, Congressman, Congressman Elijah Cummings. I don't know why she don't want to keep. Look, I'm trying. You done cook, took up half the time when you talk about your stuff. Okay. Go Oprah, y'all. Okay. This is favorite part. Y'all see me in the middle? See. <laughs> You see who Oprah got her arm around? You see that smile is on her face? And the smile is on my face? All of us were smiling. It's a picture. This was, this was at the Four Seasons in Baltimore in the harbor. Mm -hmm. um, it was a day where uh, she came and she met with, with the immediate family earlier that day. Myself, my sister, uh, my cousin Jerry, and my nephew and my son. Uh, that's my son on the left with the, um, the little silver piece hanging down. That's Alfred III. Um, and this was after dinner. No, this was before the luncheon that we had. Mm -hmm. So we took a group picture. All this is um, the Lax family. Those that weren't late, that is. Me and my mother, my sister. <laughs> so this is a closer look at that headstone. Now you can see how you can see the pages of the book now. You see how it's a book. I like to mess with my cousin David when we go out together because for years he did not know that it was a book. And I don't know how he didn't know that. But it reads, Henrietta Lacks, August 1st, 1920 to October 4th, 1951, in loving memory of a phenomenal woman, wife and mother, who touched the lives of many. Here lies Henrietta Lacks, healer. Her immortal selves will continue to help mankind forever. Eternal love, eternal love, and admiration from your family. And that's it. Thank you very much for a um, very informative and also entertaining presentation. Um, this is how we're going to do things. Um, I'm going to ask you a few questions, um, both about the presentation and as well as um, the book and uh, the effect that um, your knowledge of, of um, Henrietta's fate uh, has had on you and your family uh, to date. And then uh, I'll open it up uh, for you, the audience who uh, waited so patiently um, to ask questions. Um, so I'm, in a way, a moderator for this. Um, I, I'd just like to you know, really thank you very much for sharing um, some very close uh, aspects of, of your family history. Um, I know that some things are very um, heartfelt and, and, and difficult uh, to talk about. Uh, but it's necessary, and, and I, I appreciate all the work that you've done uh, to uh, spread the word. Uh, the, these are things that must be told. Um, I, I did wonder, in terms of, of, of the book, when, when it, um, it came out, how you, you heard about the book, you yourselves, um, when did you first learn that there was a book and that um, uh, Rebecca was working on it? Well, um, in 2000, uh, my mother told me that a young lady contacted her, which was Rebecca Skloot, and wanted to write a book. My mother, at the beginning, was very standoffish because she didn't want our family to be exploited again. 
because it seemed like every time you turned around, there were people coming to take and to use mm -hmm. the family. Uh, as time went on, um, I guess uh, Rebecca chipped away at her armor <laughs> and finally penetrated, and they became friends. Um, this was during um, my incarceration. Yeah. Uh, as I talked to my mother um, during the process of the book, she kept me informed on everything. Uh, and she told me, you know, when she was taking Rebecca around to meet the family oh, okay. to go down Cobra. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for me, because I'm, I'm much younger than Alfred. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different generation. Mm -hmm. like, and I always say that, so, mm -hmm. yes. But I also say it because it's a, the generation gap is very different in our family. Like, depending on your age bracket, is what you're allowed to be boisterous about or even be present to hear about. So for the first part, when Rebecca and um, Aunt Dale, that's what we call Aunt Dale, Aunt Dale, were going through this journey together, the beginning parts of it, it was just, I was only told that, you know, the great grandmother cells are still alive, they've been experimented on, they're doing some research. I didn't ask questions because that wasn't allowed on the kid. You know, I was lucky to get that much information. But as it got closer to when the book was finished, then that's when I was able to get more information about the, you know, the book and what it was going to entail and when it was going to come out. And then when the book was published, um, when I read it in, in its entirety, it was a bit shocking at first because then you start to see those. Um, little hush conversations that adults sometimes have around children that you don't, you weren't a part of. So I was learning a big part of my family's legacy via a book that someone else wrote. But it then gave me, I was old enough at that point, you know, I could open up conversation and dialogue with the older members of the family to ask them, did this really happen? Like, what? <laughs> you know, so that's how it was for me learning about the mm -hmm. book. What, what part do you think um, race played in um, having um, Rebecca's cells taken from, from her in the manner that um, it was? Well, race, I feel like, played a big part of Henrietta's cells being taken the way that they were. Um, every, I mean, now we try to bask in the glory of all the wonderful things that her cells have done and are continuously doing every day. But in the, the fact of it all is the way that her cells were procured was not in a very honest and full disclosure type of way. Um, she wasn't given all of her options. She didn't even know, you know, at that time what having those treatments and things would mean for her from what I'm told, because of course I wasn't born then, but from what I'm told she still wanted to have more children. And if she had known that having that radium you know, put inside of her was gonna make her sterile, and then she may not have made that same decision to go along with their treatment options. She did not know that they, you know, took that biopsy and took it to the lab and was doing experimentation and things like that. That doesn't mean that she might not have said yes, but she was never asked is the point. So it was a lot of, um, and I think a lot of that did come because she was an African-American woman you know, and in that time, there weren't a lot of hospitals that treated people that were of color and of low socioeconomic needs at that time. Um, so Hopkins was one of the only places. So it was almost like a trade-off. Like, you know, we treat you, but then we get to do what we want to do at the same time. So I feel like, you know, race along with socioeconomics had a major part in how she was treated and the lack of information that she was yeah. She was good. And, and, yeah. and not only at the time of her death, mm -hmm. but years following her death mm -hmm. with, you know, people trying to cover up, you know, using mm -hmm. different names, uh, Helen Lane, Helen Larson. Um, they didn't want to put Henrietta Lacks's name out there mm -hmm. because then they would know that this was an African-American woman. <clears throat> Did, um, we're talking about years yeah, I mean, that passed. 1950s. I mean, we yeah. were still in a very dark place um, mm -hmm. when it came to race and 
treatment and having rights for certain things, even the basic things that you, every human being should have rights to. So, I mean, it was, that was a rough time for us, to, you know, people of color in general, but that just further shows you that, you know, how less than a person yeah. that, you know, they were treated back then. That, um, I know that, that some of your own family members had a, a difficult time with Rebecca in terms of initially. Um, could you explain how, for the family members, the transition, you know, you've told me about your, your mother's warming or being chipped away at in terms of, what about the rest of the family? Okay, well, you know, as, as families do, you know, everybody have their own perspectives and mm -hmm. their own opinions about things. Mm -hmm. And my Uncle Lawrence, who is 83 now, mm -hmm. he was really the only child who remembered his mother mm -hmm. at her passing. He was mm -hmm. 16 years old. Mm -hmm. So I think it hurt him so much and to the core that mm -hmm. when the book came out and when, when Rewind, when Rebecca was writing the book, mm -hmm. I think it was bringing back bad memories okay. to him. That he's, he's tried to suppress. Right, and, and, and so he, he wanted no parts of, of it. Mm -hmm. So my uncle David Sonny Lax, mm -hmm. he, as you see in the movie, he's like, a, you know, mm -hmm. he's like the wind. Yep. <laughs> so, catch him yeah, catch him if you can. So it, it was really left up to my mother Okay. to spearhead this book okay. and to put in time with Rebecca mm -hmm. to get this book written because my mother wanted the world to know who her mother was because mm -hmm. she never knew who her mother was. My yeah. mom was two years old when Henrietta passed mm -hmm. away. You know, she passed away mm -hmm. at the young age of 31 years old with five children. Mm -hmm. So my mother never knew what it felt like to have her mother. So this was her determination mm -hmm. to let the world know who her mom was. Mm -hmm. And up to a few years ago, it was hard for Pop Pop to even talk to us about his Lawrence, mm -hmm. Pop Pop. Um, she called him Pop Pop. <laughs> I know you don't, never. I called him Pop Pop. Uh, but Pop Pop, it was hard for him to even, for us to even ask him questions about his, you know, about his mother and things even up to a few years ago, I think, you know, like Alfred was saying, like that brought back some painful memories for mm -hmm. him. You know, he was a teenager at the time. No child wants to remember their mother going through that suffering of going through, you know, cancer treatments and things like that, being in the hospital, her waving down to you from, you know, a window because you can't go up to see her and things like that. So it's still hard for him, but he's, he's opened up a lot. Um, I, w I wonder, you know, how you, you feel about Rebecca herself now. I mean, she's in a way opened up a whole new uh, world for you. Um, but how, how, do you assess, how do you assess her and her role in bringing to life? Different family members have different relationships with mm -hmm. Rebecca. I have a fine, I mean, I have a good relationship with Rebecca. She just had a birthday. You know, I sent her a message, hey girl, happy birthday. You know, she sends me messages to check in on me, like, how you doing? You know, how's work? You know, stuff like that. So, I mean, I think, I wouldn't say we're BFF, so we have a, a good, you know, relationship outside of her being the author of the book and us just being the family that she had no right about. Yeah. Myself, uh, I, have, I have a real nice relationship with Rebecca. I, I was just with her over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I had the pleasure of going to the Emmy Awards. Um, the Immortal Life of Henrietta <laughs> Lacks was nominated for uh, Best Movie, Television Movie. Um, we yes, won. yes. <laughs> uh, I think we should have won, but we didn't. <laughs> right. But the whole experience was uh, a good experience. And, uh, you know, Rebecca was there. and. Uh, 
you know, we went to the after party together. And, and I think that, like you said, <laughs> Yeah. Turn up. yeah. Turn up. Uh, so, you know, I, she did open up a, um, a whole new ro- world up for mm-hmm. our family. Um, and some people disagree with some of the things in the mm-hmm. book. Um, I, I even disagree with some of the things in the book. Mm. But as a whole, I think that it done its job to bring awareness to social injustice. Mm-hmm. to racism mm-hmm. and and to you know just how much of a magnitude how much of an impact mm-hmm. that the healing cells have made on this world mm-hmm. okay um which uh, sort of also sort of brings me back to um uh-uh, honey, it's a bug right there <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it will go um, she want to have me out on this She trying like she not from the ghetto. <laughs> and guess what? what the, bigger bugs than that. And the bug that I ever became a friend with either. That's a mosquito, um, honey. You have my little light so big. Don't, don't, don't worry. Um, <laughs> I, I sort of also wonder, you know, we understand she's had... Um, had a great impact on, on you. Um, and, and we heard uh, about your own choice to go into medicine. Um, how was that? Was that something that was evolving before the book came out? Or Me uh, becoming a nurse was definitely something that was evolving before the book com- came out, but it wasn't um, let there, uh, like the impact of my family. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Henrietta's husband, um, my great-grandfather, Day, that's what we called him, David Lacks, um, he had diabetes when I was growing up. And growing up, like, he would show me, you know, him giving himself insulin, he showed me how to give him insulin, and I think that is what initially sparked me wanting to take care of people. Because I saw my own great-grandfather going through, you know, sicknesses, and then how diabetes actually progressed, how it caused, you know, other kidney functions and things like that to, you know, start to deteriorate and things like that. So that naturally gave me the inclination to want to help take care of people. Learning about my great grandmother, you know, what her cells have done for science and everything, like that just solidified my choice to want to be in medicine. So I didn't start off as a nurse. I started out as a medical assistant and phlebotomist first. And then, you know, I went, was able to go back to school and become a nurse. So that's, my way, my ministry, how I pass her legacy along is by helping to continue to give life to people each day. Okay. Yeah. So, in a sense, a similar question to you, to Alfred, that um, your not being around, being inc- incarcerated when your mother was being interviewed for the book, um, and what led you to sort of turn your life around, as you say, and choose your ministry? Well, the most important thing that made me turn my life around was me not being able to be there for my mother when she got sick, Mm -hmm. Um, not being able to attend the funeral. Mm -hmm. So before my mother passed away, I promised her that I would have my life right and when I get released, I would make it my business to do right by her, my grandmother, and the rest of my family. Um, just to be able to give back to men that were in a position that I was in um, is very fulfilling. Um, it gives guys determination. It gives them hope. The same guys that I was incarcerated with they call me all the time. They see me on television. Uh, I do news interviews. Um, one guy even called me and said, man, did I see you on Extra one night? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, so it, it, you know, it just gives them um, you know, hope um, to do better. And as I stated earlier, my house, has eight men in it, Mm. and four of the men are guys that I was incarcerated with. 
Wow. Okay. Um, doing a, li a little turn um, now, thinking about uh, what Johns Hopkins as an institution had done to, to Henrietta and um, what's your relationship with Johns Hopkins now? Well, as, as a, well it's not like a, a, like a honeymoon cuddly. relationship or nothing like that. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it is what it is. Mm. You know, it's, it's, couple, it's a couple of faculty members that participate mm. Um, that support the family. Okay. You know, a lot of people always ask, um, Johns Hopkins haven't given y'all any money and <laughs> haven't compensated the family? Mm -hmm. You know, no. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're able to. Mm -hmm. I mean, they probably could just write a check. And, right. But, mm -hmm. you know, like I was addressing at dinner mm -hmm. tonight, um, the platform is there. Mm -hmm. So, it's up to the individual to take advantage of the platform. Mm -hmm. You know, Henrietta Lacks, it's yeah. my grandma. Yeah. So me as an individual, I'm going to continue her, continue her mm -hmm. legacy mm -hmm. and do right. And when you do right, good things happen. Mm -hmm. And Johns Hopkins might can't give a family member money, but they can give, they can donate to a cause. Mm -hmm. They can donate to an organization. Mm -hmm. So, it's all in what a person wants. I mean, they also mm. could invite one of us to go to their university because they do have one. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, <laughs> if you want to get education, yeah. it's hard out here with these city loans, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just saying, they could. Just saying. Yeah. You don't have to write me a check. Yeah. You just pay for education, honey, and I will be happy. <laughs> yeah, I think we should have a letter writing camp. Campaign. Mm -hmm. right. uh, yeah. I will go get a whole doctorate yeah. as they pay for it. Believe me. If they say, girl, go to school for whatever you want mm -hmm. and we will pay for the bill, don't you know? I will be a lifelong student. I will be a doctor of everything. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's good. Um, have, um, I know this may, may be a hard question, but. Um, have any other members of your family since um, your grandma passed um, had cancer and do you think they might ever go to Johns Hopkins for treatment? Johns Hopkins is one of the biggest hospitals and institutions where we live at. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I go there because <laughs> I don't, but we do have family members that go to well, mm -hmm. My uncle Sonny goes there. He sees his cardiologist there, and you know he says he has to have a bad thing to say about his cardiologist and everything like that. So some family members may choose to seek care at Hopkins because they are known for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But I will say the majority of us do mm -hmm. not choose to go there for mm -hmm. our medical attention. Mm -hmm. That is, I'm not saying that I would. I'm not saying I would never. Mm -hmm. Never is a strong word. Mm -hmm. But you know, if some things came up and I had to have care and that's what they specialized in and I did my research because you can have more than one option. You don't have to just go to one doctor. Then I probably would consider them. But, um. <laughs> and, and to answer your question, no, no, no. one else has uh, got a chance. chance. Okay. No. okay, that's good to know. Yes. Yeah. Um, Sort of moving on to perhaps more um, tricky or political uh, type questions. Um, in 2003, a, a Florida court ruled that um, basically you don't, if you go and get blood drawn or uh, that, um, you give up ownership of your cells, which in a sense is really at the heart of genetic your genetic material, yeah. Um, can you comment on that ruling? I mean, I can only give my your, opinion, your opinion yeah. on that. Um, I feel like as long as you are informed, and when I say informed, I don't mean them just sliding you a consent form that is 18 pages long and has the smallest font that they can find. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Want it. No, I mean, a form where your doctor actually sits down with you, lets you know what your procedure is going to be. 
that they're going to take whatever tissue or if when I, we open you up once we're in the OR and we find something else, you know, we will take that out. You, and you give permission, informed permission for them to then take those tissue samples, organ samples, whatever, you know, blood, cultures, mm -hmm and do whatever they want to do with it scientifically. As long as you are in fairly informed and you consent to it, I don't have a problem with it because then you're signing over ownership. Mm -hmm. It's not you telling me that what is mine doesn't belong to me. Mm -hmm. It's me saying, I know this is mine, but I'm giving you permission to do with it as you will once it is taken out of me. That is mm -hmm. two totally different things. I don't agree with you telling me that something that came from me isn't mine. Mm -hmm. But if you yeah. would like to do research on it, then you can ask me nicely and I can either <laughs> say yes or no. You know, that should be your option. Mm. That's the thing. They, they have a lack of options that they're giving the patient and mm. that is what I have an issue with. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're, you're, you're a nurse and... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, yeah. Um, do you think that um, given the, the kind of, of story that, that um, has been exposed by, by your, what happened to, to your grandmother, um, that African Americans may have a reason not to trust the medical doctors Absolutely. Um, Absolutely, and it's not just because mm -hmm. of what happened mm -hmm. with Henrietta. What we have to realize is people of color have a distrust to the whole system-wide of medicine, not because of just this incident, mm -hmm. because of how they were treated historically from people of Caucasian descent. Mm -hmm. So nine out of 10, you still have a little bit of that, that PTSD that's going on. And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be from your generation, mm -hmm. but every generation has learned something from the previous one. So those mm -hmm. stories have been told. So it then passes down. That is a part of everybody's legacy too. Mm -hmm. Like you passing down those tidbits of history, the things that you experience. Something as, you know, as simple as you going to the five and dime store and getting hosed down. Like mm -hmm. those are things that you hear about. So that distrust, has been a long time, you know, coming. Like, this is not something that's new that's happened within the next last 10 or 20 years. Mm. It's been hundreds of years, you know, mm. that this is, and I'm, it's going to take even more years for, for them to garner the trust of people of color. And that's not even just African American mm. people. There are any people that have migrated from other countries to over here and the way that they were treated once they got over here and are still being treated you know, right now, today. Mm -hmm. And I don't fault anybody for that, and I don't blame it, but it's up to the doctors and any medical professional, us as nurses, okay, honey, this is <laughs> um, <laughs> to take those steps, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To chip away a little bit, a little by little, mm -hmm. with each person that you encounter. I can't change the minds of everyone, because I don't know everyone. I will never meet everyone, but I can help to give a better, you know, impression of medicine for every patient that I come in contact with. And that's what doctors have to look at. You make a difference one patient at a time, one person at a time, one conversation at a time. But once you start to build a trust or repertoire with your patient, you have to be consistent. You have to be diligent. You have to keep that because the moment that they feel like that relationship is shaky or that some information you gave them was not true, then you've lost that, and it's going to take you a heck of a long time to try to get that back if they don't choose to just cut that communication off and find them a whole new position. Mm -hmm. So this is something that's going to go on. I may never see in my lifetime a time where people, you know, of color, African-American people, are just going to walk up to the hospital like, hey, friend, come on, get this blood, check me out. It's not, I don't feel like we'll have that. That's why that we are one of the most underrepresented people in research, clinical research studies, because we don't have a trusting relationship with people. We need more people that look like us to try to get us to come and to do preventative health care and things. Because I can relate to you just off the fact that you feel like we have some similar background just because we have, you know, we're both African-American. 
Same with people that are Latina or like they you when you initially meet that person, you don't know anything about that nurse, you don't know anything about their doctor, but you start to formulate a sense of comfort mm -hmm. with somebody that may be able to understand you mm -hmm. on a deeper level than just my chart, you know? Yeah. Okay. Sort of <laughs> Uh, well said. Heavy, heavy, she said it. Um, which sort of brings me to, to an, another question in terms of, um, and you've, you're answering part of it is, um, but I also want to throw it to, to, to you. Um, what, what is your next um, step, as it were, to um, spreading the message? What, communicating the lessons learned from um, your own experiences. Um, so, Well, yeah. my next step is um, I'm in the process of writing a book, um, and I'm going to tell the story from my perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it will be more in detail. Mm -hmm. It'll be more about the family versus the author. Mm -hmm. um, also, I, I, you know, I'm doing other things such as uh, I've been um, in meetings with the Postmaster General mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. to uh, get Henrietta on a postage stamp. Mm -hmm. So that's in the, in the makings right now. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, in Historic Turner Station, I thought they had the slide on there. Um, they did a street dedication in Turner Station, mm -hmm. and the street that they lived on is now Henrietta Lacks Way. Oh, okay. um, it's 15 signs um, mm -hmm. from Main Street and Dundalk mm -hmm. Avenue all the way down to where they live. Mm -hmm. And also in the state of Maryland, they did a highway dedication uh, for Henrietta Lacks. Mm -hmm. um, so, is, is a lot of things that's going to keep her legacy alive mm -hmm. that we have uh, in place. Okay. And mm -hmm. for me, I mean, you know, as a nurse, like I said, every day that I am in contact with the patient, that's my way of, um, you know, spreading that legacy. Not saying that's the only thing that I will be doing, but that is one of the ways I do. I work for a company um, called DeVita, which means he or she that gives life. So each day that I go into work, that is my mission, to help you know, con the continuation of someone's life. Them missing their treatment one day can make, make the difference of them living today or dying today. You know, so I take that very seriously, and I try to make sure that I keep my patients informed of their rights, informed of their treatment, what that means, you know, that whether you get this treatment or not, if you choose not to do this, you know, I let them know in a very realistic way, and in terms that they can understand. Yeah. You know, not to say that, you know, my patients are uneducated, but everybody's education level is different. So you mm -hmm. need to talk to people in a way that they can understand you and make sure that they really are getting the information you're giving them. I would like to go back to school and, and get, you know, a, a okay, master's degree yeah. um, instead of just my bachelor's. Mm -hmm. you know, so that way I can help. I would like to teach nursing mm -hmm. school, so I have to get my master's and my, you know, doctorate, all that good stuff. But mm -hmm. I feel like um, this right here, these... This is the future, and I would like to touch, you know, a little part of that. If I can make an impression, you know, on these young people or any, you know, in a general sense, like just to fuel them to go out there and be good people, make good decisions, make ethical decisions, you know, then that is another way that I would like to spread on this legacy. I would like to also eventually open up an assisted living to help take care of people. And I know that's something that my cousin Alfred is, has also expressed interest in as well. Because in that way, I can take charge of the care that I'm giving. Because at the end of the day, medicine is a business. You know, and at the end of the day, if they're not making that bottom line, then they're going to cut some things, do, you know. And I want to be able to be fully in charge of the people that I'm caring for and making sure that, I'm giving them care based upon what their needs are, not based upon the dollar amount that I'm going to receive for them. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I could keep on asking you questions, but I think uh, it would be fair to allow uh, questions from, from the audience um, in the few minutes that, w that we have left. 
Um, so, um, any any questions for? Come on up, friends. We just all friends for here. Victoria, so or there's there is a. You can come up and it's on. Mm -hmm. Hi, so my, my question. Sorry. It's on. Okay. We can hear you. Yeah, we can. Um, so I read in a book somewhere that um, members of the Lax family still didn't have health care. Um, is that still true today that some members in your family still don't have health insurance? Well, that part was written back when the book was first, and that was what? How long ago was that? Mm -hmm. Back in 2009. Well, that was 17, yeah, so it's, 20 it's years. So it's been a good little bop, you yeah. know, since that came out. So people, you know, in the family do have health insurance. I, I wanted to say a misconception that may have come across in the book is that the family is a bunch of um, uneducated, um, destitute people. We have careers, we have college degrees. You know, all of us know because of the age in which that generation, they might not have had that privilege to go to school and, and all that good stuff. But Pop Pop was a, you know, he worked at Amtrak. He was an engineer on the train. Like, you know, that man had health insurance, but I mean, it was true for the people that Rebecca interviewed and the story that they told. Some family members, you know, did not have, you know, health insurance, but, but they're... It wasn't, it, it wasn't, wasn't uh, immediate family. Right. You know, and, you know, like she said, it was, it was a lot of embellishment in the movie, I mean, in the, the book, you know, for entertainment purposes. Um, like I said earlier, it was some things that I didn't agree with. Um, for example, one thing Rebecca said in her book that mm -hmm. in prison I got my GED, mm -hmm. which isn't true. Mm -hmm. I'm a high school graduate with college and I'm an ex-Marine. Um, mm -hmm. what, what happened was I was teaching guys GED. I was getting guys their GED. I was a tutor. And some kind of way that got misconstrued mm -hmm. in, in the book and uh, you know painted me <laughs> like, you know, I, I went to prison and got an education. That, mm -hmm. that is not correct. And mm -hmm. I said something to her about that, and mm -hmm. she promised me that, you know, Later. every book published mm -hmm. after that would have a correction in it. Mm -hmm. So, in your books, y'all can go ahead and scratch that out. <laughs> <right there. laughs> so, to answer your question, is if we have health insurance, do yes. people utilize it the way that they should? No. No. So I, I implore you all mm -hmm. to not have your little insurance card just sitting in your wallet. Use it as much as you use your credit cards. Please go mm -hmm. and get yourself checked out. Preventative care is the message we're trying to send. So, yes. That's the only reason I asked, because the whole point was made about like the very institution that made so much money off of the HeLa cells, the, own, the family of the contributor didn't even receive. Like, the family isn't being, like, um, Offer like free health care. Oh. Right? Not that I would go to Hopkins if they offered me free health care. <laughs> <laughs> but it would have been a nice gesture. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank if you're not yeah. first, you last. You see this young man came out here all yeah. brave. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, young man. Yeah. Y'all, y'all young people better remember: closed mouths don't get fed. If you don't answer mm -hmm. the ask the question, you will never know the answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, um, my name is Catherine. I was a TA at my high school for AP Biology, and the book was a required reading. Um, and the kids and I really um, delved into the racial aspect of the book, particularly with Rebecca Skloot being a white woman. And almost some of the kids, and I agreed, felt as if she was using your family situation to help her economically. Um, and so I was wondering how you felt about having her kind of ask a lot of personal questions and sharing that, um, those histories and that story, especially with some facts that may not have been facts. Right. 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 
I agree. I agree. I think that she she um, used what she had to become a wealthy lady. Um, now, on the flip flip side, she did bring to the forefront a lot of things about Henrietta and the healer cells. But like I stated earlier, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of things that were in the book were um, public record. You could just go on the internet. And, and get the things that she put in the book. That's why I said the book was more about her and her journey to learn about our family. That's why I said, I'm going to tell the story the right way. Right, <laughs> right yeah, no, absolutely. I want to let you know that I applaud her whiteness. I appreciate it. You know, because in the fact that that's who she is, she can't help how she was born, what color she was, but just her complexion alone opened up more information than what we might have been able to walk, just waltz into Hopkins or waltz into Crownsville and been able to get certain information. So yes, her being white did open up some avenues of information that we might not have yet gotten. My cousin gives a lot of credit to the internet back then because you know it was real slow. It was shaky at best. <laughs> Back then. You know, us that grew up on the internet, it's like, oh, honey, we have come a long way. Thank God AOL is gone. But <laughs> it is true in the fact that it, that is pub, public record. You know, the information anybody could have that had that passion and that initiative to put forth that, that amount of effort could have gotten that information. Now, what I give her immense credit for is her determination. Yeah, she's making some coins now, but back then she didn't know if she would make one. You know, she didn't know if she would make a dollar, and that's... Oh, she knew. <laughs> she could have whole dream and no. wished on that dollar, but still, no. at the end of the day, Don't we all, people that are book readers, we know how flaky publishing is. You could have an awesome product out here, mm -mm. and nobody ever buys it. And they just wait until somebody nicely puts it on script or something for you to get for free. You know, that's just <laughs> the nature of the beast. But she did take 10 years of her life to research that. And that says a lot for determination. I'm not saying I'm going to put up on a pedestal and say she's the best thing since sliced bread. But that's what you got to give credit where it's due. How many of y'all say you got 10 years of focus on something that uncertain? To if, give to if, somebody. If, if I give 10 years and know I was going to be a multi million. You did, she I, didn't know that though. She knew. She didn't know how. How was Because well. we're talking about the healer cell. <laughs> but that doesn't mean we're she talking was about make something. Money. We're talking about something so dynamic. Right. And so just. One and how of many a kind, millions one, does our family have? We don't have no millions. Exactly. So the healer cell, so you said because that's the healer cell, then we should get have gotten that. It should have been a guaranteed thing for us too. But we don't know okay, that. Okay, but that's where inventions come in. You know, people, it, you know, inventions are, are created every day. And right. be like, and I should have thought of that. And they might make some money, and they might not make no money. That's what scientists mm -hmm. do it because they love it. Not because they know they're going to get a Nobel Peace Prize, or they're going to get millions of dollars. They don't know that when they stick themselves in isolation in the lab and just sitting there going after their dream, what they've envisioned in their mind, and they, they can come to fruition. We might not appreciate their craft the way that they appreciate it. Well, she's not a scientist. Mm. She's a science major. <laughs> she's a biology major. OK. I'm the moderator here, and okay. we're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello. How you I'm just doing? down a little nervous, so. <laughs> So um, science is advancing at like an, an increasing rate, and um, the literature is actually becoming more and more available to younger generations. So my question is, how do your opinions um, with um, the medicinal aspect of the advances from HeLa cells, how do your opinions differ from your children's, and how do you think those opinions will evolve uh, gener generationally? Well, I have teenagers already, and it's amazing to them, and you know, my my kid, well, my son, I should say, he, you know, got a little bit of the, the limelight, so to speak, because the book was a comedy for his high school. And of course, they, you know, Rebecca went, and my cousin, who's a teacher at my son's high school, you know, they had, um, oh, <laughs> <Good work. laughs> they had a, um, they had a little 
situation, you know, where the kids all came, they talked about the book and everything, and my son got to, you know, talk about his, you know, his perception of the story and things like that. So, I mean, my kids, they know how amazing, you know, being a part of that legacy is, and they know how amazing her cells have been for Madison. I mean, they know that there would not have been a polio vaccination without their great, great grandmother. You know what I mean? Who can say that? I mean, I can say that because she's my grandma. But I'm saying, <laughs> who, who can say that? No, nope. you know, a lot of people can't say that. You know, in vitro fertilization, some of y'all could have been born because of that, you know? So, I mean, they know the magnitude that, it, that herself have been able, and to be quite honest, I don't think medicine would have been able to advance as much as it has without having that, you know, having her cells to be able to make the first, you know, way to culture cells outside of the human body. Like, what would we have? That, that is, we would have nothing. We need all that agar and all that to know how to nourish these cells, how to keep them alive, how to be able to experiment them, how to not contaminate from one workstation to another to make sure that your research is still clean and it's still, you know, the process is still being kept. So we would not be where we are now in medicine without ourselves. Thank you. You're welcome. Did you want to say something? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And I can't say more. Uh, mm -mm. Get, get. Um, one, one more question from somebody? Awful. Well, that's a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit. <laughs> <laughs> a little short. Um, so one of my favorite parts in the book and the movie, um, we discussed this at dinner, uh, was the part when uh, Deborah and uh, uh, Zakaria were able to have the cells projected on them. Um, and I really want to know whether you guys have seen the cells um, through the microscope, because I want to know the feeling that you guys both had actually seeing Henrietta um, there or her cells there. I've got to see um, the cells under many different types of high price <laughs> microscopes that, that make you afraid to touch it. Like one of the microscopes was over a million dollars. I was like, what? It is some glass and some metal. I was like, how are we paying this kind of money? But I have gotten to see it um, in different types of lighting. They got all this cool stuff in the lab that you get to this. So I've gotten to see it. Um, I've even got to see, you know, the cells once they go through, you know, the process of separation. Or, like, like, like I'm looking at it and it's separating because her cells separate at a more rapid rate than normal cells. So I've gotten to see that a lot. Yep. Have you got to and, see my And that's my called soul? mitosis, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just trying to be. Right? Go ahead. I was trying to be all lazy about it. But okay, mitosis. Unfortunately, okay. I have not gotten to see oh, okay. the cells yet, but somebody promised me tomorrow I'll get to see them. <laughs> oh. Yes, yeah. We can show you the scope. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Hamilton right. College is where I first seen my grandmother's cells. <laughs> right in there. And I know you all have a news a newsletter here, right? A magazine? I mean yeah. a newspaper? Yes. All right, so we can write a little Do story and <laughs> you know, look through the microscope. The newsletter? Mm. Oh yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That means no look all mm -hmm. why they was like <laughs> We want y'all to read it after he get his face in there to say he spread that and pass it on to your friends. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Victoria. Enough. Oh, uh, I just, I just want to say, yeah. I know you're the moderator. No, so. but okay, no. I just want to say thank you for coming out. Um, thank you for being so interested. Thank everybody who read the book. Um, you know, our family, um, you know, just want to thank everybody. Um, and, you know, Victoria and I, her and I, we, we somehow, we always, you know, get the draw <laughs> to come to places together because there's seven of us. And, and we always get paired. And we always get paired up. Um, but I, I, I love her. And, and, and you, you see know. the chemistry there? 
Yeah, and it's real. You know, it, it's you know, it's nothing fabricated or fake. You know, I'm an outgoing person. You know, I, I don't know how outgoing she is, but you know, she's a little bit more book smart, so she can tell you uh, all about the, the little medical, bit. But she didn't know about mitosis. I like you that. I'm a science major. Of course, I know what mitosis is. You might have forgot. You can't forget that. That's like biology 101. But <laughs> just just be on the lookout for you know my book, um, and and hopefully a movie can come out of my book. And, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and he can play himself in uh, his movie. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll be a director. I'll be like this. Yeah. Some people direct. Hollering and cut. Yep. Yeah. Well, I also want to thank you all for having us and dealing with our shenanigans. <laughs> um, but I. Uh, Sorry, I always take a moment when I go to the house to be your mother. I'm just saying, y'all are here, and that is a privilege. So many people wish that they could get education, and you are doing it. Take it seriously. Be, don't just be in the seat warming it up. Anybody can do that. Be engaged. Be involved. Ask questions for crying out loud. Like, Nine out of ten of the time, somebody else behind you or beside you wanted to know the same information, but they were not brave enough to ask that question. There is no such thing as a stupid question. I know you hear adults say that all the time, or you hear your parents say that all the time. But it is true. There is no such thing as a dumb question. If you don't ask it, you'll never grow. You'll never learn because you never ask. You ask the question, and you're not just getting that information for yourself, but all the people that wish they were brave enough to ask the question out loud themselves. So do that. Don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't be afraid to be different. That is why we live in a world where we're not all meant to be the same. We're not meant to think the same or act the same. Be you and do you, but do something, honey. Don't just sit there <laughs> looking crazy. Do something. Put forth the effort. And don't be afraid to be a unicorn out here in this world with all these regular people, okay? 